for one program, you get a little benefit there. You qualify for another benefit you program. You get. A, I mean, it's a lot of work being poor, trying to jump through all the hoops for these programs, and they keep getting cut. And uh, you know, the uh, a farm bill recently uh, that was recently passed cut 8.7 billion dollars over the next 10 years from uh, food stamps, the uh, SNAP program. Uh, and, and, and that's what you get when you, it's a competition between Democrats and Republicans. We've been seeing it for really uh, flat, stagnant wages since the 1970s. Um, and it's just been, uh, it's been getting worse. And I think uh, the Occupy movement has shown that uh, people are ready to uh, organize uh, through unions, cooperatives, or, or otherwise. People are getting really creative, and uh, I'm really excited to be a, a voice for that movement. Can I quickly respond to his uh, comment about my proposal? Uh, how, 15 far seconds. That would go, how far that would go would be far enough to rebuild this country by raising $3 trillion. Europe already does let, it. No, no, you Europe let me already does the transaction you tax. Let me finish. You let me finish. Their recession you is as bad as please, America's. Please, I'm sorry, Peter. <laughs> now, listen, I listened to you. I didn't interrupt <laughs> you. I got the opportunity to respond. And now let me finish, please. First of all, it would go far enough to raise $3 trillion to rebuild this country, which is what we need. Secondly, I am not a socialist. I do believe in fairness as a principle, though. That doesn't automatically make me a socialist, and it doesn't make a socialist the one with all the answers. I do not think that just merely redistributing the wealth is the answer. I, I believe well, how that How much that, of your labor that, are again, you entitled okay, to keep? Again, let's, let, uh, let's let other people speak here. How much here. labor is a worker entitled to keep? If you produce something, how much of it is yours and how much Ms. of it is Erickson. your employer's? Let's hear from well, Chris yeah. Erickson. On I'll answer your question now or later. How's no. that? Okay, that's good. You yeah, I, 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 later. I, I want to raise the issue for the audience. It's not about you, Jerry. I want to raise the issue for the audience. Oh, good, good, good. Chris Erickson, what would you do in Congress to reduce poverty? Okay, first of all, I'd like to say that the United States Constitution clearly states we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare. Promoting the general welfare is one of our standard beliefs. It's something we have to do. Now, I believe that providing free online college courses, except for laboratory courses, all, free, all college courses could be you know, given free online, and that would help more people earn more money and when they earn more money, they pay more taxes, and we balance the budget better. Thank you. And Randall Meyer on, on the poverty. question of poverty. Um, well, I, I believe that truth is the first casualty of war. Um, and as a scientist, scientists are on the front line. Um, I shouldn't go too far into my own personal issues, but um, I've been unemployed for about 10 years. I'm a perfectly intelligent and uh, employable guy. Um, now, scientists may be less glamorous than reporters. We usually think of them as the front line uh, when it comes to uh, censorship and things like that. Um, but I think I th the argument could be made that scientists are more subject to regulatory capture than, uh, than maybe a reporter would be. Um, uh, so I'm extremely concerned about the death of the American meritocracy, um, and I think it, it gets underreported in our media quite a bit. Um, and so what can we do in the way of uh, attempting to uh, alleviate this, uh, this issue and, and, and address this concern? Um, the original, uh, I think it was Hugo Black in 1932 with the Fair, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, um, in, in 1932 proposed a 30-hour work week. I, I came up with this idea on my own. I figured 35 because we have increased commutes. I mean, people didn't used to um, have this urban flight, uh, and now they're back and forth to work, and it's an hour each way. You know, that's two hours per day. Uh, so I figured just bringing it down to 35 hours at the same pay um, would, would go a long way towards, um, um, and also maybe alleviating unemployment concerns. Um, but uh, we should also be looking at minimum wage, uh, COLA for minimum wage, uh, not just uh, increasing the minimum wage, but um, putting in automatic uh, cost, of living. Au cost of living adjustment. I mean, um, no businessman in, in the world uh, looks at their plan and doesn't, uh, doesn't work one to three percent. But then politicians one can't get credit for raising the minimum wage. Well, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Randall Meyer that's, finished. That's, that's, that's quite all right. Uh, they, don't need to, they can get credit doing other things that are more important, and uh, they don't have to worry about that sort of thing anymore. Fifteen oh. seconds. Uh, I guess that's everything uh, I want to say. Well, I, I should just make the point that poverty here in America is somewhat different than uh, poverty uh, elsewhere. And it, if we neglect that issue as well, it's as Einstein said, he didn't know what World War III was going to be fought with, but World War IV would be sticks fought with sticks and stones. Yeah. Okay, and finally, Peter Welch, um, what, what have you done 
and what would you like to see done further to reduce poverty in america well i want to say two things when that question really goes to the heart of congress is failure in the past couple of years because what has happened with congress in dysfunction and with the total focus and this is the republican leadership on tax cuts and just absolute adamant opposition to anything proposed by the president is we're seeing our economy being very fragile poverty is going up as he said the other thing he didn't say is the middle class is shrinking and the biggest challenge this country has is reviving the american dream and the american dream is about building and strengthening the middle class and creating opportunity for people who are poor to find a way to climb into the middle class and there's some things that we could do you know i was part of the congress that did things we passed a health care bill and there's millions of americans who now have access to health care that is helping them at least get through periods of unemployment job tr uh, shifts and so on but this congress we haven't even passed an infrastructure bill. So the things that we should be doing are things that have traditionally uh, been things Republicans and Democrats have done together. Basic things. Have a long-term plan and funding source to revive our infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our airports, our rail, and our broadband. Number two, we should be making college affordable. You know, the cost side, Mark, I'm in agreement with you. I don't know that we could do 10% across the board. It just is really disruptive. I talk to our folks. But you're right, the tuition aspect of it is a serious co concern because it's been like health care going up much faster than people's paycheck. But we should make college loans affordable. I mean, the government right now <clears throat> is borrowing at less than 2.5%, yet student loans or parent loans, they're paying 6 or 7%. Why in the world don't we give the benefit of that low interest rate to parents uh, and to students? That's something that would really help. Another thing that we should do is what Vermont's doing with its focus on energy efficiency and a lot of things you're working on, Jerry. If we take on the challenge of climate change, and that is real, instead of denying its existence and the threat that it poses to uh, our future, if we take that challenge on, we're going to be creating real jobs. Thank you. And we have other questions coming in on the phones. Hey, that's a good thing. <clears throat> Hello, you're on the air. What's your question for the candidates? Hi, my name is Jill Charbonneau, and I'm president of the Vermont State Association of Letter Carriers. And I would like to turn this lively discussion to another topic and ask them how they would support the long-term sustainability of one of America's oldest institutions, the United States Postal Service. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll start with Jerry Trudell. Well, I would support the Postal Service as much as it needs to be supported because there are vital things that the Post Office does, like giving medica getting medications to seniors, for instance. Uh, even though uh, they're trying to cut funding for the Post Office because it's becoming, because their, their volume is down and they're facing some economic challenges, doesn't mean that the Post Office is not an essential, uh, essential institution that's in the public interest. I don't think it should be privatized. I think it should be supported completely. And Bernie, by the way, went out and helped to save some of the post offices in Vermont. I read about that, who they were trying to cut funding for, but that would have created hardships for people who were waiting for their medication. So I guess that means I support the U.S. Postal Service more than ever. Thank you. Randall Meyer, how do you feel about supporting the po Postal Service, would you do more or less of that in Congress? Oh, well, they call it Post Road, not Commerce Road. <laughs> they, it's uh, Route 1 runs from uh, Maine to, to Florida there. And uh, Benjamin Franklin's idea, if I remember right, um, I, I certainly support them. Um, they're, they're, oddly enough, uh, on their own budget. Um, they've, been, they've been asked to turn a profit, I, I believe, if, uh, if my memory serves me right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to defer on that particular, uh, that particular question, except to say that I that I support them. Um, the, the founding fathers, Ben Franklin's one of my favorites. So, I mean, he'd be rolling over in his grave if he thought, um, if, if he saw what the Republicans were trying post, to do to he him. He was a postman. Now, uh, <laughs> I'm, so I'm going to defer, but I'm going to take up my time anyway. Uh, I don't care much for uh, well, let's stick most to the, of Let's stick to the question. Would you, you mentioned that they're expected to turn a profit on their own. If they can't do that, would you support subsidizing the Postal Service with other money? Certainly. I mean, it's a, it's a function of the government. I mean, if your letters don't come in the mail, uh, how can you get your bills and how can you uh, 
meet your uh, meet your requirements. I mean, I suppose we could use the internet, but I don't buy internet service, so uh, how will somebody bill me? <laughs> do, I, do, do I get to do I get to run for free because because uh, the government doesn't want to do their job? No. Um, so when I think of the founding fathers of this nation, I, I don't think so much of. Uh, Madison and Monroe. Once in a while, Thomas Jefferson. But I really, I think I like Roger Williams and uh, and William Penn because uh, they were nice to the Indians before they were mean to them. And the other reason is uh, they uh, they were coming from uh, places where they were persecuted themselves, and they were just looking for a little bit of freedom. Um, and so, and and Benjamin Franklin, he's part of that that older group. I mean, he founded uh, the American Philosophical Society, if I remember right. Uh, you have any other comments some of my on favorite the postal people. service? Uh, no, just that I'd support them and um, uh, wish them the best. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Chris Erickson, would you support increased funding for the Postal Service? First of all, if I understand it correctly, the, the United States Postal Service is privately run now, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So they, I don't even know why they're called the United States Postal Service when they're, because it makes it sound like they're, you know, an arm of the government, but they're a private corporation now. And from what I've read, the the highest paid person in the United States Postal Service gets a paycheck larger than the President of the United States. So would, would you support congressional funding to keep the Postal Service running in a way that would not, serve? Not unless they're taken back and given back to the people as a government-run organization and not a private organization where they can pay their top employee more than the President of the United States. Okay, thank you. And Matthew Andrews, uh, the Postal Service has been having problems. Would you support <coughs> increased? Right, well, we have to understand the context of this, and I'm so glad that we have uh, somebody from a, a union calling in on this debate. Um, I think that uh, the Post Office needs to be supported. We should understand that the Post Office is actually under attack now. It's been under attack because it's a, uh, um, it's a, there's the private sector, the companies like UPS and FedEx, they want to move in on this market. They want to capture the lucrative market, which is in the cities where uh, delivery of, of postal service can be profitable. And rural places, particularly like Vermont, that are not profitable, they want to forget it. They send you back to the, um, you know, to the dark ages, as, as earlier suggested. <laughs> so, in the, and that's actually what you see in other countries where they, you know, you, you leave the cities and you, it's like you're going back in time. And, uh, you know, the, the post office is a, a good source of union jobs, and I think that it should be subsidized because it's a public service. Furthermore, I think it should be, um, I think that we should be doing away with our, um, these kind of commercial mailings. We get all this junk mail, and I think they ought to be charged through the nose for sending us that crap. We ought to be uh, instead subsidizing nonprofit mail and individual letter writing. Uh, people, the p cost of postage is far too high, in my opinion. It's prohibitive for people um, who uh, you know don't have a lot of means and want to use it as a method of communication. I think we should bring the post office into the 21st century. The post office ought to be offering email services. The post office ought to be. Uh, I think transformed into a national bank as well. I think people ought to be able to go to the post office, not just uh, write a money order like you can now, but you ought to be able to make deposits. And um, that would be kind of like a, a public option for banking and, uh, and uh, internet service that would uh, hold the, the private sector, at least so long as we have a private sector, which is a socialist I think is fundamentally dubious, but come on, let's at least use, uh, use our public institutions to, uh, to, to set the standard for service in this country. Okay, and Mark Donka on the Postal Service? I would support the Postal Service as far as I think they supply a very important service to our country. We have to have it. Um, yes, they're being squeezed right now by emails by some of the other companies and whatnot. Um, I believe one of the issues is they, they have to learn how to run, you know, profitably. You know, and I don't think the government should, should bail out every company that doesn't run profitably. Um, one of the issues I see, and I, I maybe Congressman Welch can correct me, but I believe one of the issues with uh, their profit is they have to pay ahead their pensions, mm -hmm. which is, isn't that a congressional thing, that a bill that was passed? Uh, what other company in the country pays ahead their pensions? Um, it's a huge amount of money that the post office is paying, and it's cutting into their profits and cutting into them running their company. You know, have it run like any other company that, you know, the, the pensions get paid as they go along. Don't pay ahead to the, every time you hire somebody. Tell your colleagues that if you get to Washington, because they're partly responsible and, for that insanity. Um, before we go to Peter Welch, just one follow-up for Mark Donka. Do you feel as though if the Postal Service is unable to run profitably, 
it's the job of the Congress to apportion money that would keep it running at all? Or if it's unable to run, should it fail? I think that we should help it because the Postal Service has been around so long, we do have to help it and keep it running because it does, like I said, supply a service that nobody else does supply. So we do have to keep it running. But I think there has to be within reason and they have to be given like a time frame saying you have to get this to become a profitable business like any other business. <coughs> Thank you. And Peter Welch. Well, I'm a strong supporter of, the, of a strong postal service. You know, the post office, it's been around longer than the Constitution, longer than the country was formed before we actually had the United States of America. And it has had to endure a lot and make adjustments, you know, from, uh, from the days of delivery mail and horses to the telegraph, and now, of course, the Internet uh, has really disrupted the business model. But it's incredibly important, and the people who work in the Postal Service are incredibly dedicated. And Mark has gotten to the heart of the problem. This is not so much an issue of them not being able <coughs> to be flexible, because they are, <coughs> pardon me, or them even be able to meet the bottom line. They have Congress uh, working against it. And this is a real battle. And it literally is pretty much a partisan battle, not entirely. <coughs> but the Republicans want to do as much as possible to privatize Congress. And they've done a couple of things that have hamstrung the ability of, of the Postal Service to be flexible and to be sustainable. One is they are requiring, as Mark was mentioning, <coughs> this enormous pre-funding obligation for health care and for pensions. And, you know, it's bad if you underfund your obligation. But it's also bad if you overfund it, if you make people pay more than is required. And that's not about the security of the pension and the health care. That's about putting a squeeze on the Postal Service so they are going to be bound to fail. So that's one thing. The other is, at the same time, they're restricted on making adjustments on their postal rates. So when any business would make adjustments on their pricing, the Postal Service is prohibited by Congress from doing it. When any business would set aside the appro appropriate amount, amount, but not too much or not too little, the Congress requires the Postal Service to bear this burden. So that's, Congress has got to make up its mind. And I think the American people want us to support the Postal Service so that and give them the flexibility they need to be successful. The folks in the Postal Service, they understand the Internet has disrupted the model, but there's still an enormous need in this country, and particularly in rural areas, to have a strong and vital Postal Service. We've got the people who are trained and committed. Let's support them. To send medications, <coughs> not just mail, medications that seniors need. All right, we so have that's another... That's why we when, need I, the when I go to Congress, Peter, I will introduce something so that they won't have to prefund that. Good. We have a <coughs> My bill. another call coming in. <laughs> Caller, you are on the air. Uh, what's your question for the candidates here? Uh, would you vote to overturn Citizens United? Okay, thank you. And we will start at this end. Randall Meyer, uh, Citizens United, would you vote on a constitutional amendment to overturn that? Uh, no, not a con uh, to overturn it, yes, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> That's one word answer, yes. Well, yes, because I don't believe the corporations have feelings or care about us or our feelings, and that they should not, therefore, be considered having the same rights as we do. So I, I support overturning the notion and the law that, that corporations are individuals and can, therefore, circumvent public campaign financing that might actually make, might make campaigns somewhat more fair to the people in terms of the people being represented by a full range of candidates and views as opposed to just being represented by the the money candidates who which obviously the agenda of the extreme right wing that wants to take us back to the 15th century uh, is just that that they want to use the power of money to manipulate the entire process and that's why they did that so all right, I'll give other people the time. We're running out of time here, so. Okay, Peter Welch, we know uh, you've said earlier that you've introduced the constitutional amendment that would effectively overturn Citizens United. Um, in, in your campaign funds, you've also received a fair amount of money from political action committees. Is this a thing that you consider a kind of hypocrisy or how would you how do you rectify those two facts well there's two things <clears throat> when citizens united is completely different from anything we've seen before because the supreme court said that anybody a corporation 
an individual is not subject to any limits on how much they spend, and even public disclosure. so it's just blown the lid off of any kind of responsible rules for political funding. and i have as you mentioned i'm strongly in favor of overturning it i support a constitutional amendment. we couldn't vote a law to overturn it. it has to be by constitutional amendment that's unlikely, so it's much more likely that we're going to have to get a supreme court that will make a sensible decision a corporation is not a person. it's a lot of things. they do a lot of good things and they have a right to have their property protected, but they're not a person and the supreme court gets that wrong just like they did in one fifty seven when they said an african american was not a person the there is too much money in politics even pre citizens united any of us who are in congress are subject to whatever the laws are and i abide by those and that means campaign finance disclosure limits on what people can give any contributions i get or mark gets any of us who are filing our fec reports federal election commission reports the public has a right to know and gets to know who contributed money to us and how we uh... how we uh... spend our money <clears throat> but I do think it would be much better if we had public financing and a limit on how much we could spend and have all of us be subject to that rule. Mark Donka. Uh, Citizens <coughs> United is, uh, I haven't seen where it's given me any great deal of money. There hasn't been a lot <laughs> flying into Vermont. Uh, so I haven't seen a real issue with it. Uh, the Supreme Court has basically ruled on it. It's the law of the land. And it's going to take a constitutional amendment in order to change it. Um, I don't see a problem with it depending how it's used. I mean, right now you have unions and other companies that are, you know, donating huge amounts of money to different candidates. So I don't see what difference it is with Citizens United and what they opened up there. So I would not try to repeal Citizens United. Okay, Matthew Andrews? Yeah, Citizens United is, uh, it seems to be a talking point for the Democratic Party and Bernie Sanders, and uh, uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, hype about it, but uh, I can't really, it really perplexes me because uh, money has been running politics in this country since day one. I mean, uh, 